Ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with uh, our course in heat transfer. Uh, in terms of the overall uh, picture, we've started with chapter 4 on transient heat transfer, and then we did quite a few chapters on convection heat transfer. Okay. Firstly, on sort of the fundamentals of convection, then external forced convection, internal forced convection, and last week Dr. Lober Martins did with you a part on natural convection. Now we're going to skip a chapter which is on boiling and condensation. If you would like to do this course next semester, we will continue with that. But we are going to go now to chapter 11, which is on heat exchanges. So many of the things that you've done up to now is going to come together in terms of a very practical application of heat transfer. And many of you in industry is going to be faced with heat, heat exchanger types of problems. We have to design them or to size them. So sort of almost the most important part of the of the course. Okay, so in general, <coughs> before we actually start with heat exchangers, let's just think of, oh, so heat exchangers HX. HX is a, you'll see it a lot, a lot in literature, that is just a, what we normally refer to HX as a heat exchanger. Okay, so just in general, <coughs> let's just go back to convection heat transfer. Convection heat transfer, we have seen, can be represented in a non-dimensionalized way as the Nusselt number, which is a function of a few things. Firstly, because there's flow, always the Reynolds number. Okay. Then the Prandtl number, and that was the case with internal forced convection and external forced convection. And then when we had natural convection, the Rayleigh number also comes into play. Okay. Now these two together, Prandtl multiplied by the Rayleigh, is also called the Grassoff number. So for secondary flow or natural convection problems, we would say the heat transfer coefficient or the Nusselt number is a function of Reynolds number and the Grassoff number, but in the Grassoff number is the Rayleigh number and the Prandtl number. Now in terms of heat exchanges, it is very, very seldom that natural convection plays a role. It is with uh, some types of electronic components. We have got fins and there's just air on the outside, then that is the case. But with, I would say, 95% of heat exchanges, uh, that is normally not an issue. And we can say that the Nusselt number in general is a function of the Reynolds number and the Prandtl number. Now let's look at the heat transfer process. A heat exchanger, its function is to transfer heat. Okay. Always from high temperature to a low temperature. So let's suppose, and it will always be over a wall. Okay. So there's the wall. Okay. And let's suppose that is the temperature T0, and this is the temperature Ti. Okay. On this side, we will have a type of a flow, it can be forced flow or it can be natural convection, it doesn't matter. At the end of it you need the Nusselt number from which you can get the heat transfer coefficient. Okay, so that the resistance term is directly proportional to the heat transfer coefficient, then on this side it would be the same thing. There will be either internal convection or external convection or natural convection. Doesn't matter, at the end of the day, you need to get the Nusselt number, and from the Nusselt number, you can get the heat transfer coefficient. Okay. Now, one that we shouldn't forget is the wall. Okay. The wall itself also have, has a resistance, and depending on the geometry, let's suppose it is a type of a tube, then the resistance would be typically the limb, of the outside diameter divided by the inside diameter divided by 2 pi kl. Okay. And the k would of course be the k of this wall. Okay. If it's from copper, it's k of copper. If it's from silver, it's sil it is the k of silver. It's not the k of the fluid. Okay. So it's the k of the wall. So 
we have said that the heat transfer is just like the flow of electricity current. The heat transfer rate would then be equal to delta T divided by the resistance. Okay, the resistance for heat transfer. And or if there's more than one resistance term, we would say the total of all the resistance terms. So for this specific problem, we would say that the total resistance is then equal to 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside multiplied by the area on the outside. So that is the area on the outside. Okay? So that's the resistance term. We've done, you've done it previously. Plus, okay, the resistance through the wall, which is then equal to the limb of the outside diameter divided by the inside diameter divided by 2 pi kL, and it is k of the wall. Plus, so that's, this is the first resistance term, that's the second resistance term. Now we need to add the third one. So it is equal to plus 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside multiplied by the area on the inside. Okay. And or we can write this total resistance as equal to 1 divided by the total heat transfer coefficient on the outside multiplied by the area on the outside, which is equal to 1 divided by the total heat transfer coefficient on the inside multiplied by the area on the inside, okay. So this total resistance term can also be written in terms of the overall heat transfer coefficient. The advantage of this is the overall heat transfer coefficient, if you want to buy a heat exchanger, that is something that you can get from the manufacturer. So you do not have to go and calculate all the heat transfer coefficients on the inside. Usually they would do experiments and they can give that information to you. Okay. And not only that, but also the area. So it is 1 divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area is normally given to you as an engineer. Now, it happens in many cases that if we have heat transfer over a wall, we might have one of the two sides with a very, very high resistance. So let's suppose if we do it on scale, let's suppose there is a massive big resistance term. Okay, this one may be very small, and that one also relatively small. Okay. So let's suppose you have a practical application like that. When would that happen? That normally happens, for example, when you've got a gas on this side and this side a fluid. Okay. If you've looked at your correlations, and typical values that you can get in literature and in the textbook, you will see that the heat transfer coefficient on the outside would be very low. Okay. Okay, so if this value is very low, you see, 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside multiplied by the area on the outside, if this term is very, very low, we have a very, very high resistance on the one side. So. The solution is in many cases to put up fins or to enhance the area. Okay. So if we take the same area, we can put some fins on. Okay. Now my fins are not to scale. <laughs> Normally they are very, very thin, okay. very, very close to each other. Okay. And the result now is that, again, the fundamentals doesn't change. There's on, the, on this side, we have 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside multiplied by the area on the outside. Okay. If we have flow on this side, 
Okay, then there would be the resistance, that would be the resistance of the wall, and this would be the resistance on the other side. Okay. So again, let's call that T0 and that Ti. And the heat transfer would be from the hot side to the cold side. Obviously it can be the other way around also, it doesn't matter. Right, now if we put up fins here, what is going to happen firstly with the heat transfer coefficient? The heat transfer coefficient is going to increase. Why? Why is the heat transfer coefficient going to increase? It's going to increase because the flow is going to cause flow separation and the boundary layer can't develop. The moment it starts developing, you trip it and you start from scratch. You'll remember that when we looked at flow over a flat plate, for example, the heat transfer coefficient as a function of distance. Typically, in the beginning, the flow is not fully developed. So in terms of the boundary layer, the boundary layer would start getting thicker and thicker. Okay. So the thinner the boundary layer, the higher the heat transfer coefficient will be. And that is why you put up fins and all fancy stuff to keep on tripping the boundary layer all the time. Oh, unfortunately, there's a penalty, and that is the penalty is a higher pressure drop. So if you've got a fan here on the outside or a pump, and you put up fins, the pressure drop is going to increase and you will have to put in more pumping power. Okay. So, if this thing gets larger, then the resistance would get smaller. You agree? So that's the first advantage of doing something like that. The other obvious advantage is your area now suddenly increases. So you can significantly increase the area by a factor of 10 or 20 by using fins. Okay. And then the result would be that this massive resistance term would decrease. Okay. Now, before we look at fins, there's something else that we also have to take into consideration, and that is fouling. Okay. Fouling is deposit, or when it gets dirty on the outside. So, we take into consideration fouling as follows. We would say that the total resistance is still equal to 1 on the outside, the heat transfer coefficient on the outside multiplied by the area on the outside, plus Rf0 divided by the area. And Rf is the fouling factor. Okay. plus lin of the diameter ratio divided by 2 pi kL plus now on the inside 1 divided by the transfer coefficient multiplied by the area on the inside plus the resistance on the, the fouling resistance on the inside multiplied by the area on the inside. Okay, so if we put up fins here, they're going to get dirty. Okay. Dust and everything is going to collect on it over time. Small leaves and branches and stuff, stuff like that is going to start blocking it if it is not cleaned regularly. So we need values for these fouling resistances. And typical values are given in your textbook in table 11.2. It's not comprehensive at all. It is just a few values and it is a science on its own. Getting a fouling value is very, very difficult, especially a very accurate one because obviously it changes with time. Okay. But just to give you an idea, the fouling, the units is typically meter square multiplied by Kelvin divided by watts. Now, if we have distilled water, if it's distilled water and the temperature is typically smaller than 50 degrees Celsius, okay, 
then a typical foul, fouling value would be equal to 0 0.0001. Okay. Again, if it's distilled water and the temperature is larger than 50 degrees Celsius, then it would be double. Okay. Now some of you might live, or your parents might live, in other parts of Gauteng and in the country, typically maybe in the western Transvaal. There you, you must know that if you have water there and in your geyser and in the kettle, it's not distilled water. So you have huge, huge calcium layers that would collect on the surfaces. Okay, so take note, so this is for distilled water. For water like that, the fouling factor would obviously be much, much higher. Okay. So that's typically for water. Now surprising the air, what do you think would air be, approximately? 0 0.004. Just with the dust and everything on the outside, very, very quickly you've got deposits on it and it would put in an extra resistance term which would decrease the heat transfer rate. Okay, now. There's a very special case in your textbook which is being used and many students will just use it. Be careful. Okay. So the special case is if we look at these types of problems and firstly we say that fouling is negligible, there's no fouling. Okay. And The inside area is approximately equal to the outside area. So if we look at this tube here, if we look at this tube, typically if this is a copper tube of about 15 millimeters or so, this thickness would be less, would be approximately 0.5 millimeters. Okay. So if you take that into consideration and you calculate that area and that area, they would be very, very close to each other. And as the diameter increases, it actually becomes closer to each other. Okay. So the special case, when the areas start being the same, okay, then if we look at this equation, what happens in the equation? Okay. If the area starts in being the same, then the outside diameter of your tube is approximately the same as the inside diameter. Do you agree? Okay. And it would mean that the ratio would be approximately one. The diameter ratio of the tube. Okay. And then it would mean that the limb of one is zero. Okay. The limb of one would be equal to zero. And it would therefore mean that if we now look at this term there, that term would be negligible. Something else that can also make it negligible is the thermal conductivity. If the thermal conductivity is very high, then that would also contribute in making that term negligible. So, these days there are actually plastic heat exchangers and it would sort of go against our grain because we would say, well, the thermal conductivity of plastic, my goodness, you know, it's a factor of 10 lower than that of copper or steel or something like that, or a factor 100 lower. <laughs> well, the answer is, it doesn't matter because of this. If it's very thin, this term disappears. That is why in many cars these days the radiators are made from plastic. Okay. Does it make sense? If it's very, very thin, that term disappears. <laughs> Doesn't matter what the thermal conductivity is. Okay. Right. Now obviously if we say there's no fouling, 
Okay. And this area is approximately equal to that area. Then we have the very special case that the total resistance of a heat exchanger is equal to 1 divided by UA. And the area now doesn't matter of if it's inside or outside. Okay? The area doesn't matter, 1 divided by UA, and that would be equal to 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside plus 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside. Now we've, I've sort of concentrated on this case where there's no fins. So let's suppose there is fins on the outside or the inside of the geometry. How do we handle fins? How do we handle fins? Okay. Now the first thing to remember is that the surface area always would consist of the finned area plus the unfinned area. The finned area plus the unfinned area. So if I would now make it a little bit larger, like that, okay, and I'm going to use different colors, okay. the fin area would be equal to the area of the fin. And the number of fins, so if you calculate it for one fin, you multiply it by the number of fins. Okay. So this would be the area of the fins. The unfinned area would be the area between the fins. Okay. Right. Now, what many students battle with is in the test and the exam, when I give you one or the other uh, tube or whatever, with certain fins, maybe a hundred fins or a thousand fins or something like that. And the issue that many students have is, where do they start? <laughs> okay. So, I mean, if this is the surface, uh, you know, would it typically be like this, that it, it is a half distance from the beginning. Okay. Of course, maybe I will just give you the length of the tube and say there are so many fins on it. And then you're going to end up maybe here with a fin exactly there, something like that. Okay. And now students start becoming worried about, you know, the areas that there and there or whatever or where the fin starts. Well, the answer is, if you've got 100 fins or 1,000 fins, it's negligible, it doesn't matter. So, so you can do it however you want. Okay. Right, now, in terms of your conduction heat transfer course that you did last year, okay, you did fins, and there were two types of fins. The first type is the short fin. Considered as the short fin. Okay. Now, what is a short fin? A short fin is a fin where the temperature is isothermal. Okay. What does it mean? It means that let's suppose that temperature there is 100. Okay then the temperature there would also be 100, and it would be there 100. It would be 100 everywhere. Okay. That is what an isothermal fin is, a short fin. And there's definitions in the textbook how you can calculate if a fin is a short fin or not. Okay. So we do not have time to do that, but it is there. Okay. Right. Now, let's suppose, okay. Now, if you've got a short fin, then it is very easy. You can just calculate the surface area as I've shown you. Okay. By the fins plus the unfins. No problem. Okay. Let's suppose it is not isothermal. If 
not isothermal. Who of you can remember what you do then? Well, it is very easy, you're going to say, now the surface consists out of still the same unfint area. What does unfint mean? It means this area between the fins. Okay, unfint area, the area on which there's no fins. Plus, the fin efficiency multiplied by the area of the fin. So if it is not isothermal, if I can use this example again, let's suppose the temperature there would be 100, then here on the tip of the fin might be 90. So you'll see that the temperature is not constant, it's not isothermal. So therefore you need the fin efficiency if you've got cases like this. Right, so with this in mind, you can calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient just like I've shown you. Doesn't matter, very easy and very simple. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? Nothing? Okay. Now let's look at different types of heat exchangers. There's approximately five different types of heat exchangers that we're going to do here in the, t in the textbook. But there are many, many more in industry. Okay. But these are some of the five most important ones, and we're sort of ju just going to concentrate on the first two or three in, in this course. Okay. Now the first type of heat exchanger is called a parallel flow heat exchanger. Please divide your page into two. Parallel flow. And the other one is called a counter flow. Parallel flow heat exchanger and a counter flow heat exchanger. Right, with a parallel flow heat exchanger, we have typically a tube. Okay. And let me get some colors. And let's choose that as the hot side. TH is hot. And I is for the inlet, the hot inlet. And this is the hot outlet. So the inside stream is the hot stream. We would like to transfer the heat to another stream, because that is the function of a heat exchanger to transfer the heat from one stream to another stream. Okay. Now, that would be the cold side, TCI for inlet, the cold side inlet. And that would be, oops, the cold side outlet. Okay. Right, so if we look at the flow of the heat exchanger, We'll see the direction is in this, is, in, is from left to right. But on the other side of it, the cold stream would move in the same direction. And that is why it is called a parallel flow heat exchanger. If we look at the temperatures, <coughs> okay. if we look at the temperatures, then the hot side would do something like that. The hot side. And the cold fluid would do something like that. Okay, so that is hot and that is cold. If we look at this heat exchanger in terms of heat transfer rate, where will the maximum heat transfer rate be? At the inlet, of course, I mean because the temperature difference is the largest. But as the heat exchanger increases in length, the two temperatures become closer to each other and the heat transfer rate would decrease of the heat exchanger. Does that make sense? Okay. 
Right. Now the counterflow is now exactly that one. We still have the hot fluid on the inside and the hot fluid, hot fluid going in, hot fluid going out. Okay. But now we change the direction of the other fluid. So we previously it would come in here to come in there. That's the inner temperature now, and that is the outlet temperature. Okay. So in terms of directions, you can see that on the inside it goes from left to right. In the annulus it would go from right to left. Just want to clean the board. Right, now let's look at the temperature profiles that we would get for a counterflow heat exchanger. For the counterflow heat exchanger, the hot side temperature would do something like that. It would obviously decrease in temperature as it transfers the heat. The cold side would do something like that. That's the hot side and that is the cold side. So you'll see that with a counterflow heat exchanger we do not have this problem. We almost have a pinching of the two lines. Okay. So in practice, and we will get to it later on, you can actually prove it, the counterflow heat exchanger will always get, give you more heat transfer than the parallel flow one. Something that was a big discussion last year with the YouTube videos is that where should the hot fluid be and the cold fluid be? <laughs> okay. Well, the answer is it doesn't matter. Obviously, these things are well insulated. It is very rare, rarely that you can have insulation where the losses is more than 1%. So it's well insulated. Your choice of putting it the hot there in the cold there or the other way around usually is being determined by the flow passage which is going to give you a heat transfer coefficient. So if you go and do the, the calculations for both sides, one of them, the fact that you have to select a certain geometry, as you know, I mean you buy them just with certain, <laughs> you know, you cannot, you cannot change it, uh, you buy it off the shelf at 10 millimeter or 15 millimeter or 20 millimeter or something like that. So that normally limits you. Once you've made the selection, you've got your mass flow rates, you're going to calculate your heat transfer coefficients, and based on that, so based on your heat transfer coefficients and your areas, you will have to s decide which is the better, dot on the inside or maybe on the outside. So it is just an engineering calculation that you need to go through. Okay. But there is no general rule. That is the important thing. Okay. Do you understand now what is a, a parallel flow heat exchanger and a counter flow heat exchanger? Now there are other types, the next type of heat exchanger is called a compact heat exchanger. That is the second type of, type of heat exchanger, a compact heat exchanger. Okay. Now firstly, what is compact? It is a relative thing. And for that reason people defined a beta, which is called the area density. So every compact heat exchanger has a beta value. Okay. And what it gives us 
is the heat transfer area divided by the volume. So how much heat transfer area is there? Per volume. That is a compact heat exchanger, or the definition of it. And in general, if beta is larger than 700, then we will say the heat exchanger is a compact heat exchanger. Okay. What are examples of compact heat exchangers? Okay. Your car radiator is a good example of it. It's a compact heat exchanger. Okay. And the typical value for a car radiator would be about a thousand. About a thousand for your car radiator. Then it can go up to about six thousand for glass, ceramic, gas turbine heat exchangers. It can go to 15,000 for the regenerator, which is being used in Stirling engines. But the best one is, which one is the best heat exchanger? Compact heat exchanger. Hmm? Somebody that can tell me. It is the human lung. The human lung is the most compact heat exchanger that you can get. So the human lung has a value of about 20,000 square meters per cubic meters of heat transfer area. Now this morning when I was preparing, I was trying to figure out now how does this thing work, your human lung, because I don't know, and I'm not a medical person, so Erin, if you can just show that on the laptop for us. So in principle, what you have, the human lung, what it does, it, it cools the blood in your body. So you've got blood at a high temperature, and air is being used to cool it. And that is why the outside temperature, when you breathe out, is at a higher temperature than the, when you take it in. Okay. So you've got all the different veins, and in principle, you've got almost something like this. So you've got the blood on the inside and the air on the other side. The principle. Okay. But it is actually more complicated. It looks like something like that. It's called a trachea. And I also didn't know what a trachea is, and I was worried somebody's going to ask me. The trachea is your windpipe. <laughs> so when I saw that, I understand it's your windpipe. Okay. Then this windpipe is going to branch out to smaller and smaller veins. Okay. Okay. And take note, they end up in the capillaries. Okay. Now the capillaries. The thickness of the capillary tubes is one cell layer. So just one cell layer thick. Okay. The diameters are, are approximately 5 to 10 micrometers. And they end up in these things which are called alveolis, And there are 300 million of them in your lung. Okay. So that is why it is so effective as a compact heat exchanger. Okay. So how it works is... You take it in, in your windpipe, then it goes into this trunk, and then it splits into two bronchiolar, bronchiolar tubes or bronchi. Okay, then there are thinner tubes called bronchiolars, branch out from the bronchi. Okay? And the bronchiolars end in tiny air sacs called the alveolis. And these air sacs have very thin walls, small blood vessels called capillary, run through them, and there are about 300 million alveolis in a normal lung. So just to give you an idea. So that is why it is so effective. Right. The next type of heat exchanger is called the cross-flow heat exchanger. Because as you can think, if you're an engineer and you look at these two configurations, then the next question would be, well, 
you know, can't I put the one, perpen one flow stream perpendicular on the other one? Okay. And this is typically how they look like. If you look at the slide, you've got these plates. Okay. And between the plates, there will be a flow. And the direction is now perpendicular to each other. Okay. While in the flow is through the inner tubes. And there are also two different categories. The first category is unmixed. Okay, so it's this one on the left. And it means that if the flow goes in, it cannot move in a lateral direction. It is forced to go through that channel. It's called an unmixed one. And then the one on the right can move in a lateral direction. And that is called a cross flow. Cross flow. Um, an unmix, a mix, sorry, a mixed cross flow heat exchanger. Okay? So that's the third type of category of heat exchanger. The fourth one is very, very important. It is called the Shallon tube. Shell and tube heat exchanger. Okay. So what I'm going to do is now very, very simplistic. I'm going to draw a shell and tube heat exchanger. Okay. So the shell means it has a shell on the outside, typically something like that. Okay. That's the shell. Okay. And in the shell we have a tube sheet okay. at the front and at the back. Okay. A tube sheet. And connected through this tube sheet, we have tubes. I'm just going to draw in three to show you the principle. Okay. Okay. So in terms of hot and cold, let's in this side, in this case, choose the tube side to be hot. So there it would go in, okay, and then it would go through all these tubes in that direction. Here it will go out, and there's the outlet of the tubes, and the flow will go out through there. Okay, so in this case, the hot fluid is flowing through the tubes. Now, what I now can do is I can op put in an opening there. And since I've learned something now about counterflow heat exchangers, I can decide, well, let me put in the cold fluid on that side. So the cold fluid would now be on the outer side of all the tubes. You understand? Okay. So that is the most basic type of shell and tube heat exchanger. But it doesn't end here. They do all fancy stuff because the first thing that you can do now is you can say, well, uh, why don't I put a baffle, baffle in here? A baffle in here. The baffle doesn't close up the inner tubes, it's just on the outside. Okay. So what you're now going to have is the flow on the outside is going to have a path, something like that. And I've put now another baffle here. I can do something like that with the flow. Okay. So the first thing I do is I sort of force a cross flow over the tubes, not a parallel flow or a counter flow, a cross flow type of thing. And the whole flow path actually increases in length. So put on another one there, so that the flow would typically do something like that. Okay, so that is called a shell and tube heat exchanger. Okay, normally in size they are relatively large and for that reason they are not being used normally in the automotive industry and in aerospace. Okay. And also small ones like 10 kilowatts or so are just not cost effective, usually you're talking of hundreds of kilowatts. So large heat transfer rates, they're large in size, 
but very, very effective and very, very good. Now you can start doing lots of combinations or configurations of the shell and tube. So if I just show you the shell, okay, just in terms of the shell, okay. if I would now do the following, I would put in a baffle like that. Okay. It doesn't mean there's no more baffles like this. I can still put them in. But what is now going to happen is that this flow, in principle, is going to do something like that. Okay. And for that reason, it is called a two-shell pass. A two-shell pass heat exchanger. And I can have a three-shell pass or a four-shell pass heat exchanger. Many, many different configurations of it. Okay, so that is in terms of the shell. Now let's look at the tubes. With the tubes, we've looked at the flow coming in here and then go out there. But why can't I, in terms of my tubes, connect them like this? So they come back in direction. Okay. And there again, I would do something like that. And maybe again. So that's now on the inside. Okay. So in terms of just keeping to the colors, that was the hot. It would go in there and go out there. And now it is called a, a four tube pass heat exchanger. Four tube pass heat exchanger. Okay. So you can have a two shell pass together with a four tube pass heat exchanger, for example. Okay, you don't have to learn this stuff. It's in your textbook. There are very simple sketches that show, is, show it to you. So in the test or exam, if I refer to a two shell pass and an eight tube pass heat exchanger, just go to the sketches and you'll see exactly how it works. Okay. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? If not, thank you very much.